today is a very auspicious day. It is the 125th anniversary of the birth of Tajuddin Baba, one of the five perfect masters of Meher Baba. So I thought I would share some of my thoughts regarding Tajuddin Baba. Intriguing and uh, very interesting. He was born uh, in a village near Nagpur. The name of the village is Kamti and he was born on 17th of January 1881 at 5.15 a.m. When he was born, he was still, there was no movement in the baby and the parents and the dog and the parents were worried whether the child is living or the child is still, whether, whether the child is not living. So what they did, they, 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 they branded the child on the forehead and they branded the child with, on the palms. And then after this branding, they were not sure if he was uh, he, he was alive. If he was alive. And because it was oh. still, still baby. Oh. No movement in the baby. So the parents branded the child on the forehead and on the palms. And then when the child was branded, then the child started to move. And that was Tajitin. That child was Tajitin. See, this is all happens. This all things happen according to the divine plan of the Supreme Lord. And then the parents, the mother's name was Mariam B and the father's name was Sayyid Ahmad Badruddin and the father was a commander in the British Army. He was a battalion commander and then around 1862 when uh, Tajuddin was about 16 years old, he lost his father mm -hmm. and he became an, an orphan. And because of that, uh, uh, his condition became like a uh, lunatic person. So people thought that Tajuddin was mad and they sent him to the asylum, mental asylum. And he was in the mental asylum for for a long time and during that period he was raised by his grandmother and then around 1879 he came across a spiritual master and his name was Hadrat Abdullah Shah. So Tajuddin at that time was going to school. And when the saint Hazrat Abdullah Shah visited the school, what did the saint do? The saint took out a biscuit, he ate half the biscuit and the other half he gave to Tajuddin. That was as if the prasad by the Sadhguru to that child. And then that is how the spiritual journey of Tajuddin started. And that was the year 1879. Thereafter, to cut the story short, short, Tajuddin was drafted in the army, and he was he was sent in the armed forces uh, in one of the British uh, British military. And when he was in the army. Then what happened? Then he was given a duty to work in a jungle. And when he was in that jungle at night, then somebody told Tajuddin to go and bring a... Uh, uh, he, he was there in the jungle on duty and somebody called him from the forest that Tajuddin come in the forest. So when he came in the forest, then again he met with another spiritual master in that forest. And the name of that master was Hadrat Daud Chisti. He was a Sufi saint. And the meeting how, with how do, well, I'm sorry, Hadrat Daud Chisti. Okay. He was a Sufi saint, belonged 
thing to the chisti order. So that at that time, in that jungle, with the grace of that Sufi saint, Tajiti got the realization. Mm. And that is how the spiritual journey of Tajiti. Tajiti at that time, because he was born in 80, uh, he was born in 1881, 18, uh, 1881, he was... Yes. Thereafter, as soon as he got the realization, he lost the consciousness of the body. And his boss asked him to go and bring a cup of tea. But he was he didn't respond at all. So in that state, when he was in that unconscious state and he became totally forgetful of the grass body and he attained that state of Analhak. Analhak, I am one with God. And then there subsequently he became Masu. And in that condition, the British army said that this man is unfit for the army, so they asked him to go away. <laughs> so, a spiritual master is being driven out by the British army. <laughs> see, the, see the divine plan. And when he reached home, his, what the calamity was facing on his face, because his grandmother, who had tended him from the childhood, she had expired. Mm -hmm. And Tajuddin was left as a mom. Thereafter, the story begins to unfold further. In 1883, he came to Nagpur. And when he came to Nagpur, then he, his name became famous because he had many disciples and he was known as a Sadhguru because people would come to him and because the, on the, the, due to the powers that he had and many miracles were attributed to him. So when people knew that here is a person who performs miracles, they started to flock around him. And just one or two miracles I said. One, once it so happened that a family of the weavers was inside the house and the house caught fire and the whole family was about to burn. And Tajuddin with his spiritual help, he caught the entire family out of the fire intact. That is so like that many miracles are attributed to him. He, he raised some persons from the deathbed and so on and so forth. In the year 1892, he was in Nagpur and then it was the British rule and uh, as he was uh, in a totally intoxicated state and unaware of his gross body, so he would discard the clothes and he would move about in a naked condition. And as he was moving like this in Nagpur, he was moving about in the tennis court and in that tennis court the British ladies were playing tennis <laughs> and they said that here is a man who is moving naked on the street arrest him and put him in the jail so Tajuddin was arrested and he was he was he was put not only in the jail but he was sent again to the asylum mental asylum and he was asked to carry in the mental asylum headloads of earth. Some building was maybe constructed, so they used the, the lunatics as laborers and asked them to carry the headloads of the earth, uh, the work, uh, this. Uh, Gamala. The Gamala. The Gamala. The Gamala, and he was asked to carry the Gamala on the headload. What is a Gamala? Gamala is a, you know, a, a big vessel oh. in which you put the earth. And they carry on the head for constructing the house. So, oh, okay. Tajuddin was asked to carry this load 
of earth on, on this gamela on his head and lo behold when he was carrying what people are see, seeing people are seeing that the gamela is floating in the air <laughs> it was this is the power we need him and it is falling tajiti what a sight is it must have been so like that there are many stories and there after when uh his reputation reach the ears of the king of nagpur nagpur was a state and it was ruled by a king and the king's name was raguji raguji bhosle so when for bhosle 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 b h o s l e bhosle so when raguji heard this reputation raguji went to the sen and requested the sen you please come you please come and stay in the palace and this happened in month of september 1908 and so from the lunatic asylum to the palace but for sadguru everything is same so when he was in the palace then more and more people started to come and bow down to him then a most wonderful thing happened he was uh from the palace he was moved to another building near the palace because many people were coming and disturbing so there the the king made a separate arrangement for him and then subsequently he shifted to waqi sharif this small village near samer in uh, not far from nagpur and in waqi sharif tajuddin had his had his uh, head quarter like for meher baba we have got meherab in the in the same manner for tajuddin it was waqi sharif and in waqi sharif the sadguru will hold his darbar and the disciples would come and he would tell them and it was such a wonderful thing that waqi sharif place that uh, this waqi sharif is 18 kilometers from nagpur and there were five parts in that village and and he had his complete set up tajuddin in those five parts one part was a dispensary the second part was a school the third part was a court where he would decide the matters relating the disputes of among the disciples or the devotees and uh, then the fifth fifth part was the parade ground where all the de- devotees would assemble and rajiddin would ask him to ask them to take, uh, to uh, to conduct the parade left right left right he would do and that had its own spiritual significance and remember this court or the school particularly the court and the, there was a mosque also where he would sit so all these places the court was just at some symbolic of a tree so like that he would he had his ministries five places in waqi sharif and this was around the period of 1908 and there after what happened when he was in waqi sharif in 1915 he came across one young man who was spiritually intoxicated and who was who did not know what was happening to him and he came to waqi sharif and he met tajuddin and who was that young man mehrwan mm-hmm. sheryar irani mm-hmm. <laughs> so it is the first meeting of their mama mehrwan with tajuddin in waqi sharif and that was in the year 1950 how that meeting must have been held what must have been the atmosphere at that time and how glorious both of them would be looking it must have been a sight for gods to see so when devan approached tajuddin tajuddin was seated on his seat and he got up and he had a rose in his hand because he was very fond of roses and he picked up the rose and he 
when there was Vervan was approaching Tajuddin, Tajuddin got up from his seat and with the rose in his hand and with that rose what did he do? He he tapped tapped Nirvan on his head with that rose. And he 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 ran that rose all around the face of Nirvan. He tapped Nirvan on the head with that rose and he, he just ran around the rose around the face of Nirvan. What was tapping inside? And with that touch of the master, Nirvan was tapped got more spiritual experience, more bliss and more divine pleasure. So that was the scene in Bhakishari. And thereafter, in the month of December 1915, Nirvana came, came to Shirdi and he met Sai Baba. And the rest is history. Same year, 1915. Yes, yeah. and subsequently, the same subsequently in the same month, on the 15th of December, Sai Baba asked him that whatever treasure I had, I have passed on to Upasani. So don't come to me, you go to Upasani. And Nirvan Shiryar Irani went to Upasani and Upasani Maharaj picked up that stone and threw it at, at that young man, Nirvan, who was approaching and it struck it exactly on the forehead and the blood started to ooze and that was the spot where Nirvan was kissed by Baba Jan and was was transformed, was transported in that state of bliss. What must have been that sight? So leaving Nirvan there, we come again to Tajuddin and we come to the year 1920. By 1920, Tajuddin again returned to Nagpur from Vakishev and he again began to live near in the palace of the king. He had given whatever he had to give to Mirwan. That contact was over. But what happens to him? Then again his, his reputation began to increase that here is a Sadhguru who is so powerful and is performing miracles. And he was fond of music, as all Sadhgurus are fond of music. So Tajuddin wanted to listen to the music of one of the well-known singers whose name was Janaki. And she came from Delhi to sing before, before Tajuddin. It was in the year 1920, about 95 years back. And she was a well-known Ghazal singer. So she wanted to sing Ghazal in front of Tajuddin and it was raining cats and dogs and the singer came in that drenched condition in front of the Sadhguru and in that drenched condition she walked through the mud and she wanted to perform and from there again because he had come again to Vakishari so this singer came to Vakishari in that drenched, drenched rain and through that mud and she came before Upas, before uh, Tajuddin and she sang before Tajuddin. It was raining heavily and it was all smushy and dry. At the same time, the moon was shining and in that shining moonlight of, shining light of the moon, Janaki sang ghazals in front of Tajuddin. Thereafter, around 1925, in the month of August, Tajuddin dropped his body. Which year, I'm sorry? 1925, 17th okay. of August. 17th of August, 1925, when Mehbaba had just started right his silence. Right after Baba started his silence. Yes. Hardly about a month or so after he had started, because Baba started his silence on 10th of July, 1925, and exactly one month and two days, that is, uh, I'm sorry, one month and seven days, 17th of August 1925 at Nagpur, in the palace, Tajuddin dropped his body. Thereafter his body was brought to the uh, place where the tomb is now and that place is now known as Taj Bhag. Mm. Taj Bhag. 
and that is the place of pilgrimage for the aspirants. So today, on this 125th birth anniversary, I pay my humble homage to Tajuddin. Thank you. It's Taj Taj Bab. Taj Bab. Bab. Taj Bab. The Garden of Roses. Okay. Thank you. Taj Bab. I, I just some of those Taj types of words. It's hard to pick up. Thank you. That is the place. So I bow down to Tajuddin and also to bow down to the divine connection between Tajuddin and Nirvana. So with this wonderful story, please shall we move on, on further? Please, yeah, please. We're going to continue about Tajuddin Baba. Tajuddin? Oh, I, you're, you're going to Upasani? Yes, from Tajuddin I shall go to Upasani. Yeah, I think that would be appropriate. Upasani uh, Maharaj, oh. he oh. was a one of the most extraordinary circles in the entire universal spiritualist history. Because he was born as a devout, very strong, orthodox Hindu family, Brahmin family. And his master was Sai. So, a Hindu, devout Hindu, strong orthodox Hindu becoming a disciple of a Muslim saint because we do not know what is the lineage of Sai. Somebody says that Sai Baba was a Hindu, somebody says that Sai Baba was a Muslim. But Sai Baba would sit in a mosque in Shirdi. So Upasani was, he had such a wonderful life and his family had a spiritual history. His grandfather was a spiritually realized master. Oh. The grandfather of Upasani, Govinda Shastri Upasani, he was a spiritual master by his own right. He, he was a spiritual was, master? In the sense that he was on the seventh plane. Oh. He was Brahmi Bhut. And Brahmi Bhut, you know, is as described by Meher Baba in God Speaks, Brahmi Bhut is a person who drops his body within 3-4 days after his, he gets God-realization. So that was the status of the grandfather of Upasana. And throughout his, throughout his life and early childhood, particularly when Upasana had left his home in search of God, he was guided by his grandfather, by the spirit of the grandfather. So he was born living. So that is the most extraordinary thing thing about Upasana. And it was his grandfather who eventually guided that Upasana was moving all over places in search of a guru. And somebody said, you go to this guru and you go to this guru. And Upasana was fasting and he was like a skeleton. He had married, but he, he forsake his wife, he forsake his family because his mind was restless. And he was in search of God. He wanted to meet God. He wanted to find God and he was just like a fish without water. And he was restless. And then eventually somebody said that you go to Upasani. And in that restless condition, Upasani. Upasani, if someone said to Upasani to go to? He was wandering different places. Uh, and I'm different places, yes please. Oh, I'm sorry, I just got mixed mm -hmm. up. I thought you were saying Upasani was like a fish out of water. Yes, yeah. because he was searching for God. Okay. He okay. was searching I, for God and, and he went to this saint and he went to mm -hmm. that saint and he went to this person and that person and eventually some spiritual master said that you, why do you ever come to me? Go to Shirdi. Go to Sai. But Sai Baba, but Upasani was reluctant because he was a Brahmin. And how a Brahmin will go to a person who is sitting in the mosque? Though he is spiritually advanced. So he was rather hesitant in the beginning. But eventually he said, Darcy, that I must go and meet Sai. So let me go. Let me go at least for one day. Let me have his darshan. So Upasani got down 
at the Chitrali railway station and when he got down, there was nobody at the railway station. And from Chitrali railway station, he was lying on the platform in that emaciated condition, just like a skeleton of bones. Two days he laid down on the platform. He wanted to go to Rahata. And from Rahata, there was no conveyance. The bullock carts would come to the railway station to fetch whatever goods that has come and they would pick up the grains, sacks of the grains and they would load the bullock carts and they would go to Rahata. And if some passenger is there, they would take him in their bullock cart and go to take to Rahata. So he had to wait for two days at the railway station. And eventually some bullock carts came and then Upasani said, ah, please, please take me to Rahata. Then he, he was taken to Rahata in those bullock carts. When he came to Rahata, from Rahata he said that, why don't you take me to Shirdi? I cannot walk. He had become so frail. No food. He was fasting for months in such a ghat. And just like a skeleton. So this Pulakar, Wala, took mercy and took him to Shirdi. He got down near the mosque and limping. He had a staff in the hand. And with trembling, he was he was there in Shirdi. And somebody said, "You have come. I have come to Shirdi. I have come for darshan of Sai." Then said, "You stay overnight in this uh, uh, dormitory, and next morning you will have the darshan of Sai." So he stayed overnight in the dormitory. And early morning, he got up and he was waiting for the darshan of Sai. Now what was the habit of Sai? Every morning he would get up, he would stay in the mosque and from the mosque he would get up and he would go for morning ablution, you know, for evacuating his bowels. So that was the role. And that spot where he would evacuate his bowels was known as landing. landing. So from mosque to landing, that was the role. And he was going on that road and Upasani came out of the dormitory and he, he put his head on the feet of Sai. And that was the first meeting of Sai and Upasani. And Sai looked at Upasani and said, Who are you? Why have you come here? I have come to have your darshan. I am searching God. I am not able to find God so far. So I request you to help me find God. You want to find God? I see. Oh, you stay here. You stay here. You stay here for seven days. Okay. So he went. So Upasani began to think. I came for one day. I thought that I will take his darshan and go away. And this master is telling me to remain here for seven days. What sort of master is he? So, perforce. Upasani had to stay in Shirdi. After seven days, every day he would go and ask Sai, shall I go? Shall I go? And Sai would say, you stay, you stay. So this went down. Then at the end of the week he said, uh, he went to Sai in the mosque. And he said to Sai, I am leaving today. Sai said, if you want to go, you go. But you come back after eight days. So Upasthi said to him, sir, at least I am, now I am with you. So he goes to the railway station and it so happens, the things so happen that he keeps on wandering and again on the seventh day, he is again at Shirdi, Upasthi. See how the master wants. And again he goes for his darshan. So like that the relationship developed gradually. And Upasthi said, now why are you staying in that dormitory? You go and stay in the temple of Vithal. There was a temple. And though it was a temple of Khandova, but Sai would say that it is a temple of Vithoba. Now Vithoba is an incarnation of Vishnu. And Khandova is an incarnation of Shiva. The temple was Shiva, but Sai would say that it is a temple of Vishnu. So Sai said, you go and stay in the temple. So reluctantly, Upasani, was starving and just like a skeleton, he goes and begins living in that temple. When he goes in that temple, 
What does Upasmi see? The temple is full of garbage. There is only an idol of Khandava, that is one of the incarnations of Shiva, and there are some, you know, some uh, other idols, and then the whole place is filled with garbage. And there are scorpions, and there are snakes, and they are hanging from the wall, and all the cobwebs. In that condition, Upasana goes and starts living in that temple. The pujari of that temple comes in the evening for lighting the lamp. When he comes in the temple, what does the pujari see? This one man is lying there inside the temple. So he is shocked. He says, that why are you lying here? And Upasani says, Sai has asked me to stay in that temple. So the Upasani goes and brings this broom and gradually the place is clean. And in that, in that condition, Upasani starts living in that temple. And in that temple, Upasani begins to get the spiritual experiences by the grace of Sai. And those spiritual experiences are one of the most amazing and one of the most astounding spiritual experiences that an aspirant can have from the Sattva. I will not describe in detail, but this is what happened. And gradually, Upasani was receiving the grace of the Master. And gradually, Sai was showering his grace on Upasani. And gradually, Upasani was, his spiritual personality was developing. What was that scene in Shirdi? And one interesting thing happened. Sai Baba was openly showing his, his preference to Upasana. And Sai Baba had already disciples. They were there for many years. And, and Sai was pref showing his preference to Upasana. So, there was disturbance amongst the older disciples. They were thinking that we are with Sai for so many years. And this fellow has come just a few years back, just a few months back, and he is becoming favorite of Sai. So, what is this happening? So, one day, Sai Baba, in front of all the disciples, when Upasani was sitting and Upasani was pressing the legs of Sai in that mosque and all the disciples were there, Sai Baba looks at Upasani and he declares. What does, what does Sai declare? Sai declares that Upasani is my chief disciple. He is my Pattashishya. He is my Pattashishya. And when he declares like that, the other older disciples are shocked. He, he is my what? Sorry? He is my chief disciple. He is my chief. The disciple. most, okay. my dearest disciple. Okay. My dearest, he is my dearest. So the older disciples were shocked. They looked at Sai and they said to Sai, What are you doing, Sai? We have spent years and years together serving you and you are giving all your treasure to this fellow. Then Sai looked at them and Sai says, You do not know what is this, what is the uh, stature of my disciple. Sai is saying in front of all the disciples that the stature of Upasani is such that Upasani is on one side and the entire world is on another side. This is the declaration which was made by Sai before all his disciples and they were shocked. They said to Sai, one of them was very bold, he questioned Sai, he is saying Sai that Sai you are giving him the inscription written on, uh, on copper plate that you are my chief disciple, you are writing on copper plate and giving it to him. Then Sai looks at that disciple. And Sai smiles at that disciple. And Sai says that, look here my dear, 
I am not giving this inscription to him, to Pasani inscription on the copper plate. I am giving the inscription written to him on gold plate. This inscription I have written on gold plate and I am giving to Pasani. Why? Because the copper plate will get rusted. But the gold plate will never get rusted. And this is my declaration. And that was the installation of Upasana. What must have been that scene? And since that day, people, the devotees who would come for darshan of Sai in the mosque, they would also go to the temple for the darshan of Upasana. Because Upasana was being established as another Sadhguru. See the wonderful ways of the Master. And Sai would be living in the mosque and he would have Hindu disciples and all the Hindu disciples would gather in the mosque and they would perform Sai's Arati. In the mosque and in the temple, the Muslim disciples of Upasani would come in the temple, before the temple, and the Muslim disciples of Upasani would perform the namaz in front of the Hindu temple. See the paradox. And that is how the master works. And Upasani's life is filled with extraordinary tales of uh, the stories of spiritual significance. There are so many stories, but I would just like to share one, maybe one story. Would you like to hear? Uh, now, these are the stories uh, from the ashram. You know, Upasani had shifted eventually to Sakori and he had his own ashram. And Upasani would give his discourses in the ashram, in Sakori. And along with the discourses, he would tell the stories. As uh, underlying the spiritual experience of some spiritual significance of some of the uh, human properties. Yeah. So there is a story how a, before a Sadhguru, everybody is equal. It, the story goes like that. There was a small village and in that small village, there was a Sadhguru. And Excuse me a moment. They were asking about the video. It's good. It's good. So don't touch it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, video is good? Yeah, okay. because if, if they touched it, we would have to stop. Okay. Yeah. So if okay. the, if the good. video is good, what do we say? We, Avatar, Mehra Baba, Kijay. Avatar, Mehra Baba, Kijay. Avatar, Mehra Baba, Kijay. So, as I was telling, there was a small village. And in that village, a Sadhguru was living. And the Sadhguru was very popular amongst all the adjacent villages and he had a lot of following and many people would come for his darshan and the Sadhguru was in a state of bliss he would be always smiling and he would receive the people in that smiling condition now the Sadhguru had many disciples and in their own way they would offer services to the Sadhguru. And one of the ways the service is offered to a Sadhguru in India among the Hindus is to press the legs of Sadhguru. Oh. So the disciples would come and press the legs of the Sadhguru. And the Sadhguru would be very happy. And he would be very in a blissful condition. And the disciples would also think that they are honored by the Sadhguru. So they would come and there were many such disciples and they would think that it was their privilege to press the legs of the Sadhguru and offer their services to the Sadhguru. So this went on for many, many months. And in that village, there was one devotee of that Sadhguru. But that devotee was belonging to a very low caste. He was an untouchable. And those disciples who would come for pressing the legs of the Sadhguru, they were Brahmins. They were from the very high caste of the society among the Hindus. 
So it was the privilege to them. They were thinking that it was their privilege. And this poor man who was a devotee, he goes to the uh, to the hall, to the temple where the Sadhguru was there and he stands outside and people come and ask him, what do you want? Why have you come here? And the poor untouchable devotee, he says that I am a devotee of the Sadhguru and I want to offer services to the Sadhguru. Then they ask him, what services you would like to offer? I want to press the legs of the Sadhguru as all of you are doing. They look at him and they tell him, how can you do it? How can you dare? It is only the privilege of the Brahmins and untouchables are not allowed here. So he is disappointed and he goes and he goes crestfallen to his hut and in that hut he begins to pray to the Sadhguru. And here all the disciples are pressing the feet of the Sadhguru and Sadhguru in the bliss. After some time, what happens? This untouchable who is staying in the hut and who is prevented from depressing the feet of the Sadhguru, he goes to the bazaar. And in the bazaar, what does he, he inquires? What is he inquiring about? He is inquiring about wooden legs. So he inquires about the wooden legs. And he finds in the bazaar wooden legs. And he brings those wooden legs and keeps those wooden legs in his hut. And he begins pressing those wooden legs. With the same feeling that he is pressing the feet of his master. This is what is happening in that poor hut. In that hut of the poor untouchable. What is happening to the Sadhguru? The Sadhguru in his own blissful condition and the people and his devotees are pressing his legs. And suddenly what happens? The legs of the Sadhguru are swollen. There is infection in the legs. And the Sadhguru is sick. And the people do not know what is to be, what is to be done. So they call the doctor. The doctor comes and examines the legs. And he, he shakes his head. He says that the legs of the Sadhguru are infested. They are diseased. So the, he shakes his head. What is the remedy? The disciples ask. The only remedy is that the legs of the Sadhguru have to be amputated. So, they, so the disciples are shocked. Not because the legs are being amputated, because they will be deprived of spreading, pressing those legs. So with great reluctance, they give permission to the surgeon. And these legs of, this, of, the, of the Sadhguru are amputated. Then there are no legs left for the disciples to press. And the Sadhguru is still in that blissful condition. What does Upasani say further? Upasani is saying to all his disciples that the disciples of the Sadhguru were restless. They, were go they went around the entire village because the doctor said that you can fit the wooden legs to the stumps of the Sadhguru and if you want to press, you can press those wooden legs. So the disciples are searching all over the village. Is anybody having wooden legs? So they come to the hut of that untouchable and they enter the hut and what they find that that untouchable is pressing the legs <laughs> made of wood and the disciples go there and tell him that you please lend these legs to us so that we can take this wooden leg and fit it to our, our Sadhguru. The the poor villager says that I can allow you to take these legs only on one condition. And they ask what is that condition? He said that you can take these wooden legs to the Sadhguru provided <coughs> I should be the first person to press the legs and it should be my privilege to press the legs. 
and all other disciples are crushed for us. They have to eat their own words. And they said, okay, 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 you can do that. So they permit and their wooden legs are brought and they are fitted to the Sadhguru. And the Sadhguru uh, is in the bliss. And he start pressing the wooden legs. Because he got the first preference, that untouchable. Got the first preference to press the legs. And the legs are fitted, the wooden legs are fitted to the Sadhguru. And he begins, this untouchable begins pressing the legs, wooden legs. And Upasana is saying, as soon as that untouchable starts pressing the legs, the legs get life and the legs come to life. And the Sadhguru has his own legs again. <coughs> what a wonderful story. And Upasana says that this is how it happens with the Sadhguru. For the Sadhguru, everybody is saying, may he be the Brahmin, may he be the attentable, may he be belong to any caste. But that disciple should have that devotion for the Sadhguru in his heart. So that was the story, one of the stories. I want to tell you. Thank you. Very beautiful. <coughs> It's a, that the story is in that book that you translated. Yes, yes it is. In that Can book. you say about that book? You were talking it about it with me. Yes. Uh, about the other and about these are all how Upasana gave to your father all the stories. Yes. Can, yes. Say? Now, can you can you yeah tell us that about yes. your father and this connection with yes. the stories now, and the Upasana was as I was telling was an extraordinary subject. And his connection with Nair Baba was equally extraordinary. Because it was the person who brought Nairvan Shirya Irani to the cross consciousness gradually. And during that stage, Nair Baba, Nairvan Shirya Irani met Upasani in 1915. And from 15 to 1919, so that period of four years or so, Upasani. Upasani was in Sakuri, Upasani was in different places and Nervan was in his discipleship. Nervan Shirya Irani was under training with Upasani for a period of four years. And not only that, during that four year period, Nervan composed so many songs, so many ghazals and under the Could we name, wait for a minute so I could change the tape? Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think also Zara was asking for uh, you to come to the point of your father's connection with, yeah, when, once we start. Oh, I've got eight minutes. Go ahead. You've got eight more minutes. Oh, yeah, I've got one minute. Eight on here. Eight, eight minutes before. Habib number one is saying what wonderful stories. Eight more minutes. Um, this one might as well finish before we change. After eight minutes, we'll finish. We change. Okay, please. Okay. See, as I was saying, the connection between Upasani and Nirvan was unique and extraordinary. In the same manner, my father, Gadekar, Baba used to call him as Gadekar, his, his full name is Ramchandra Gadekar. And my his father's name, that is my grandfather's name, is Kanoji. So the connection of the Gadekar family starts from my grandfather. And as I told last time, it starts in 1922 because he made the chappals for Mehrbaba in 1922. That was my grandfather. And my father came in Baba's contact around 1923-24 when he was a school going kid. And uh, when he was just about to graduate from the high school. And Subsequently, my father got married around 1930. My father got married with my mother in 1930. And after the marriage, my father had had a, had a child after a year or so. And with that child, in the year 1931, my father and my mother and that small child went to Sakuri. Mm -hmm for having darshan of Upasani. And during that time, Upasani was staying in the ashram. 
and that ashram was in full bloom because a lot of devotees was come but in the ashram of upasani there were lot of rituals and lot of strict discipline and this upasani aarti would be performed very early in the morning and then all the devotees would gather 4:30 in the morning 5:00 o'clock in the morning like that and so before that aarti everybody has to take bath cold water bath from the well from the water taken out from that well and cold water bath at 4 o'clock in the morning and to be ready for the aarti of the father so my father and my mother along with that small child went to upasani ashram for having the darshan and in that cold my mother would keep that child on the stone at 4 o'clock in the morning a child which was hardly one month old and she would take cold water bath and also give cold water bath to that child <coughs> it was very trying must have been trying for the child and then they stayed for a couple of days in that ashram and then they came back <coughs> they came back to pune after having darshan excuse me who was the child child my elder brother your elder brother my elder brother first child first child which my parents okay. had his name was vishnu and when they came back to when they returned to pune after having the darshan of upasani mm-hmm. that child uh, contracted pneumonia because of the exposure to severe cold in sakore and then it could not survive it expired that child and my father went for getting medicines for that child who was very sick and he was going on the bicycle in pune in the early hours and he fell down on the ground from this bicycle he had a fall from the bicycle and he broke his arm my father so with that fractured arm we brought the medicines but that that child could not survive so that experiences he had and thereafter my father went to solapur 1900 and around 19 uh, uh, he was he came to solapur around 1930 or so and in the year 1930 31 32 upasani had come to solapur for giving the darshan and my father went and met upasani and requested upasani to visit our house so upasani said yes i have come ye to tum jagah he stayed in marathi that i will come and visit your house so upasani visited the house of the gadikar family that was in the year 1932 or so by that time gadikar had already come in very close contact with mayor baba he was one of his close mandali he was a teacher in the school hazrat baba jan school and he was posted wherever he was posted he would tell about mayor baba he had organized a big darshan program in sangamner 1931 and there after he came to solapur so when we had come to solapur he requested upasani to visit the house and upasani came to the house and you know upasani he would not wear anything just a you know gunny bag tied around yes. tied a rag tied around his loins that's all otherwise he was naked and in that state hundreds and thousands of people would come for his darshan and in solapur there was a big public darshan program so when he came he was and then when he came to our house my mother welcomed upasani my father welcomed upasani and both of them prostrated before upasani and upasani was very happy he was sitting in the chair and my parents were sitting in front of him is there any photo of it or no pardon me is there any photo not picture no photo no no camera that's right. no camera no photo no camera no photo and they were sitting and the disciples of upasani were sitting were standing by upasani and then upasani was very happy when he came to our house and uh, my father was also he must have they must have folded their hands and then upasani told his disciple are tu asa karata ki aapne pustak aata prasiddh jhala na te pustak ghev mi in marathi what does it mean he told the disciple you go and fetch that book of my biography which is published recently 
So the disciple goes. That was the one that Baba had published? No, no. No, no. That was in 1922. The book. So when the, the disciple fetched that book, and uh, this is not the book that Baba had commissioned. No, that was right. the same one. That was commissioned way back in 1922. That was published in 1922. I am talking about 1922. <coughs> Ten years thereafter. So that is the bigger book. And that book is the biography of Upasari in his own words. In his own words. So, and the name of that book is Upasane Lila Amrut. Upasane Lila Amrut. That is the name of the book. And what, what, does, the, what does it mean? The name Upasane Lila Amrut. This is the original one, 1922? Or no, the later one? The later one. Okay. The later one is a bigger one. Oh, and right. the, oh, the later one is a bigger one. Later one is a okay. bigger one. It's about 600, 700 pages. Okay. And the title of the book, I repeat, is Upasane Lila Amrut. What does it mean in English? It means the nectar of the glory of Upasani. I repeat, the nectar of the glory of Upasani. That is the name of the book. And the book was brought and what does Upasani do? He grabs that book from the disciple, takes it in his hand and signs that book and gives it to Gadekar. Wow! Huh, huh. And that was one of the Excuse most. Me, who was the author? Most, that was your father. Most precious spiritual treasures in our family. Book yes. signed by Upasani, given to Gadekar. So that book was with us for many, many, many years, from the year 1932-33 to the year 1949-50. So for that long, the book was with us. Who was the author? Author, it is it is spoken by Upasani. No, I mean, who wrote it? Who, who oh, wrote it there together? is no name of any author. But it is said that these are Upasani's own words. Okay. Printed, okay. later Some, on, printed. Somebody jot it down and printed later on. Yeah. Okay. But Upasani's own words. So, in the year 1950, what happened? Uh, we were in Pune and uh, my father was totally devoted to Meher Baba and wherever he would go, he would tell stories of Meher Baba and he would deliver. In our house, in the year from 1947, 48, 49, 50, this weekly meeting would be held in our house in Pune and the people would gather there. And the Pune Bhajan Mandali was born in our house. Madhusudan and Subhadra and Thade, the elder Thade, LB Thade, all they were introduced to Baba in that room by my father. And then uh, there's uh, singers like Madhusudan and Subhadra and Ramachandra Gaikwad and uh, you know uh, Rangole and uh, uh, Bhausa and uh, Bade, they used to be one of the earliest people. And Bandelu, the Bandelu family and then the entire Thade family that was brought to Baba in that room by my father. Mm -hmm. And he would tell, he would tell about Meher Baba. He would tell about the discourses of Meher Baba. And once during those discourses, he mentioned about Upasani, my father. Mm -hmm. And my father mentioned about Upasani and during this course of that lecture, my father mentioned about that book which Upasani had given to him in 1932-33 and that everybody was stunned to listen to that and after the, my father's lecture was over one of them went and approached my father and he said that may I have a look at that book oh why not you can have a look at that book then he went and grabbed the book and brought that book and showed it to that person with that signature of Upasani and that man says May I borrow this copy for reading? And my father said, Yes, you can. Because my father's nature was such that whenever he would, anybody would ask him anything, he would give it to him. In the name of Baba, in the name of Meher Baba, if anybody asked my father anything, he would give to him. He would even, he had given his own overcoat to a, a sadhu who was shivering in the cold because he was taking the name of God on the railway platform. So my father took out his overcoat and 
gave it to that thing. Uh, to another person, he gave out the ring, gold ring. That was how my father was. And he would speak and spread word about Meherbha. So when this gentleman took that book, which was having the signature of Upasana, and given to my father, specially, and that book was taken by that gentleman, and that gentleman never returned that book. And one of the greatest spiritual treasures in our family was lost to the eternity. And the what? It was lost forever. But couldn't you go to that man and get it back? No. We do not know who was that man. Oh. You mean My your father didn't know the man? No. Who did he come with? How did he come in the house? Oh, somebody told him that he he he's telling about Meher Baba. So he came. So he, he must have heard about Meher Baba. So your father he, gave a stranger you possibly no, signed for? No, not to a stranger. He was he was known to my father, but my father was thinking that he will return the book one day, he will return the book one day, he would return the book one day, and thereafter he forgot. And that person also forgot. Okay. Do you know who that person was? I do not know. I wish I had known. But that person also might this happened in 1950. This happened in 65 years back, 66 years back. Okay. That person also must have, must have, must have gone to God, must have been merged. That book also I do not know. But, but as Meher Baba would have it, now I am having that copy. Oh, you have a copy? I have a copy of that book oh. by as Meher Baba would have it and I am working on that book. I am working on the English translation How of did that you book. get a copy? Oh, that is another oh. story. That is the story. book is in Marathi, right? It is in Marathi. And then you are translating to English. English, yes. Oh, yes. wonderful. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. I have already translated the 1922 book of Upasani. Ah. That will see the light of the day, maybe this, this, during this year or maybe next year or so. Oh, wonderful. That, that project is complete. And the other project, the bigger one project, I am through about 40, 40, 45, 40 percent or so. I am working on, working on that with the help of a yeah. guy. So you've translated the one from 1922? Yes, the first book. The first one, and that is available? It is not yet. It's available. not yet available. It is okay. in the process of okay. being published. But it's the one that Baba had published. Baba had asked one of the greatest writers in Marathi literature. Baba had given money to Nath Madhav. This happened in 1920. We go back. Rewind. Okay? 1920, what happened? Meher Baba called the, one of the greatest writers in Marathi literature and gave him 200 rupees, two, I'm sorry, 2000 rupees at that time. For what purpose? To write the biography of Upasani. And that writer went to Upasani and he jotted down everything. And, and also there were inputs by other devotees also like Sadashu Patil or Khatsai. And then they sit, they would sit near Upasani and they would jot down the story of Upasani. And that book about 150 pages or 200 pages that was published in 1922. And it was out of print. Again, the Sakuri Asam reprinted it. And that book, I worked on that book and that book is translated and it would soon be published. This year or next year? That is the account of wow. Upasani's life till 1920. Wow. But the other book is having the account of Upasani's life till about 1931-32. And thereafter, it will be published next year, you said? Hopefully. Uh -huh. Baba willing. Baba willing. There are Baba willing. We all leave it to Meher Baba. Yeah. Yes, but that project is over, another project is there. But Upasani, see, uh, Baba, Meher Baba did not visit Sakuri Ashram for a long time, for many, many years, he, he did not visit. And all these years, 1940, 1950, that period, all these years, Upasani, because by that time, you see, Meher Baba came to Meherabad 1923, he established, Mehrabad was established in 1923, 
from 1923 to 1930, 1940, throughout these years, what happened? Upasani was asking. 20, 23? I'm sorry. No, Nehru Baba. 20, 20, I got all that. Just the date. 23? Nehru Baba? 23. Okay. Thank you. That's it. I got everything. Yeah. And then so, so, since 23, because here, 23, 24, 25, Nehru Baba was being known as Sadhguru Nehru Baba. He was not, he had not declared himself as the avatar. He was known as Sadhguru Nehru Baba. As a matter of fact, some of the earliest, one of the earliest biographies, one of the earliest biographies of Meher Baba has, is entitled Sri Sadguru Meher Baba. That is in Marathi and that is written by Dr. Deshmo, Sri Deshmo, 1939, first biography of Baba in Marathi by Dr. Deshmo titled Sri Sadguru Meher Baba. Mm. And that Meher Baba was there in Meher Baba, 1930, 1940, it went on like that. And throughout all these years, what was happening at Sakori? Upasani was there. Upasani was pleading. Upasani was pleading with Meher Baba. First of all, he pleaded to Meher Baba. He said, to, why are you observing silence? Why did you observe silence? Why have you started observing the silence? You break the silence. Enough is enough. Meher Baba used to say, my silence is ordained by God. So whenever God will ordain, I will break my silence. So my silence will continue. Then, what happened in Sakuri? In the year 1930, 1940, during that tenure period, Upasani would repeatedly request Meher Baba to visit Sakuri. Please come and visit Sakuri. And under one pretext or the other, Meher Baba was not visiting Sakuri. It so happened. This went on for many years. On one hand, his own Sadhguru is asking him to visit his ashram. On the other hand, Meher Baba, who was Sadhguru himself by that time, was rather was did not visit that ashram. This went on for years and years and years. And every time Upasana would plead to Sadhguru Meher Baba. Eventually, in the year 1941, Meher Baba said, Yes, I shall visit, I shall meet Upasana. But I shall not meet him in an ashram. I shall not meet him in Meherabad. I shall meet him at some convenient, mutually convenient place. And that place, at that time, Meher Baba was in Satara. And it was decided between both of them that they will meet at a small village, Dahigao, near Sakura, about 15-20 kilometers from Dahigao. Because in that village, Dahigao, there was a farmhouse of one of the disciples, common disciples of Meher Baba and Upasani. His name was Yashwantra Borauke. I have seen Yashwantra Borauke. So, in that farmhouse, it was decided that the meeting will be held between Sai Baba, I am sorry, between Upasani and Meher Baba. Meher Baba was at Satara. From Satara, and the date was fixed. The date was some, I don't, I got the exact date. Uh, um, is this the 1941 meeting? Yes, that is the 1941 meeting. That is the 19, that is 19, they are meeting, 1941. Okay. It was probably the month and of Kuluma September. And came to. September, mm -hmm. September. And, Nehe Baba was in Satara. From Satara he came to Nehrabad. In Nehrabad, he sent for Sarosh. And asked Sarosh to come with the car. So Saraj came with the car, and in that car, Meher Baba was. Meher Baba got into that car, and Padri was there. Padri had his camera, so with that camera, Padri hopped into that in that car, and also 
probably there was Adi there and Chagan, some, some other one or two Mandali and in that car, Saroj, Meher Baba, Saroj driving and Meher Baba sitting on the next to the driver and these two people, two, three people sitting behind, one of them was Padri. And Gulmai was there also. And Gulmai. Yeah. And they went to Begao in that farmhouse and they got down and Meher Baba went inside the hut. And they, as soon as he got down from the car, what does Meher Baba do? He tells Saroj, Saroj, now you go to Sakuri and bring Upas Nivaras. So Saroj in that black Chevrolet, he goes to Sakuri and in that ashram, Upasani is waiting. And Upasani gets into the car. It is only Upasani, nobody else, because Meher Baba had said that I shall meet only Upasani. So only Upasani in that land cloth and uh, gunny bag, only Upasani, the, he comes in that car and gets down from the car. As soon as he get, Upasani gets down from the car, Padri starts clicking the pictures on the box camera. It was a pinhole camera. And he starts clicking the pictures and rolling the and roll. And he, he we have got those pictures. So as soon as he gets down, then uh, Gustaji was there. I am quite sure Gustaji was there. Gustaji and uh, other disciples, they bow down to Upasani. Because Gustaji was, Gust was one of the disciples with Upasani. And Upasani told Gustaji, whatever I have, I, whatever treasure I had with me, I have given to Merva. So now no need for you to stay here. You go and stay with Merva. So Upasani was, uh, Gustaji was there and Gustaji bows down to Upasani Mara. Gustaji gets, gets up and Upasani gives an embrace to Gustaji. And they start walking. And Padri is kicking the pictures. And Saroj is also there. And then he is taken to that hut. As soon as he goes inside the hut, all the other people, they, they vacate the hut and in that hut only Meher Baba and Upasana. Only these two persons are there. Nobody else is there. Everybody is waiting outside. What happened inside, we do not know. But later on, it was came to be known that Upasana was pleading with Meher Baba, please break the silence. And it is said that he has taken his hands in his own hand. Upasani took hands of Meher Baba in his own hand and put his hair there in the hand and he was weeping profusely. Upasani was weeping profusely. And that meeting lasted for two minutes or so and thereafter both of them came outside there. And then Meher Baba escorted Upasani to the car. And he got into the car and then Meher Baba told Saroj, you go and drop him in the ashram. So Saroj goes and drops Upasani in Sakuri ashram and comes back. And after he comes back, Meher Baba gets into the car along with all the disciples and the party comes to Meher Baba. And after reaching Meher Baba, what did Meher Baba say? Meher Baba said, that this is my last meeting with Upasani. This happened in the month of September. And in the month of December, 1941, Upasani dropped his body. The month of December. December. Upasani dropped his body. See, that is the divine plan and the divine will. The connections between the Sadhgurus and their disciples and their evolution of the aspirant are so intricate and so intriguing and so fantastic. <laughs>